Um, I, I mean, I, I would, I would, I would caution people against drawing conclusions about Fukushima. Uh, I mean, in epidemiology, if you suddenly, we, we are well aware that if you suddenly start to look for something, then you're liable to find it, and then you might think that it's caused by whatever it is that you think you, you know you're looking for. My, my, my message is that this is, is certainly happening. All of these things are certainly happening. And they will certainly be affected by Fukushima, but they're, but they're probably part of a general process, which, which I believe is the result of the contamination of the planet with radionuclides. And people say, oh, well, what about the pesticides and the chemicals and this and that? And I'm not, I'm not trying to say, suggest that those things don't have an effect, but the primary effect is the radiation, because, it, because chemicals get into the body and they can be metabolized. They can't get to the DNA, because there's a whole battery of, of detoxification mechanisms to stop them getting to the DNA. But the radiation can go straight to the DNA because it goes right through everything. It's, it's, and the body is completely um, transparent to radiation. So the radiation can get to the DNA. And the, DNA, the chromosomal DNA is what defines all of us. It defines the plants, it defines the fish, it defines the insects, it defines everything. And, and if you can smash that up, then you're going to get all these effects right across the board. And that's what we're doing, smashing them up. We're smashing them up because these stupid physicists have got this stupid theory that we can be, be, um, be modeled as a bag of water into which you put energy. They refuse to consider the chemistry. They refuse to consider the biology. And now they even refuse to consider the massive evidence that they're wrong. Massive, massive evidence that they're wrong. But I tell you, there's a little bit of light at the, uh, at the, on the horizon. And that is that I learned today that the Japanese parliament has actually passed a law um, to do with the develop actually to do with the development of nuclear energy. But inside it, it says that the, the people who develop the nuclear energy have, have to ensure that people are safe using the risk model of the ECRR. And that, that is formidable. That, that is actually a, a massive, massive change because the, the risk model of the ECR would not allow the sort of thing that's going on in Japan at the moment. So that's cause for applause, really. Yeah. Um, this question came from Debbie Pinchon. Based on your work in Fallujah, is there any ratio between fascination of plants and that of birth defects in human populations? Could you say that again? Because you faded in a bit. Based on your work in Fallujah, is there a ratio between fasciated plants and that of birth defects in human populations? I don't know. I haven't done any work on, on plants in, in Fallujah. I mean, you would expect to find uh, effects from radi radiation exposure in, in all systems. Uh, Based on your work in Fallujah, is there a ratio between fasciated plants and that of birth defects in human populations? I don't know. I haven't done any work on, on plants in, in Fallujah. I mean, you would expect to find uh, effects from radi radiation exposure in, in all systems. Uh, but, but, that, but actually, the particular kind of radiation in Fallujah, which is, which is uranium particles, I think probably wouldn't affect plants, because plants have a, have a particularly good way of keeping uranium out. They have a positive exclusion mechanism in the root system. The, the French have done a lot of work on, on, on looking at the effects of uranium on plants, and they found that you cannot, um, you cannot contaminate a plant with uranium. The, the, the plant will keep it out, because it's got some mechanism on the root system that keeps it out. So probably not, that would be my guess. Um, this is particularly a human epidemiology problem, or I suppose, anyway, a, a, a mammalian epidemiologic problem, because you have to have something to inhale the particles, and then they get into the bloodstream, and then they get to the get to the chromosomes, and get to the placenta, and get to the babies, and then they cause these deformities. Do you know personally of any scientists or engineers that are in the process of developing new technology, robots or otherwise, to deal with Fukushima? And does any of it seem hopeful or promising to you? Right. Okay. Um, uh, no is the answer to that. Uh, I, I think that, um, that all of the work that had been done with robots to try and sort out Chernobyl showed that it's impossible to use uh, robots because the problem is that the 
electronic systems that robots work on cannot sustain, um, uh, they cannot function when the radiation fields get too high. Because the radio see, when radiation impinges on, 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 on a substance, on, on a, an immaterial, what it does is it creates electrons. That's why it's called ionizing radiation. It ion, it, it, it's absorbed by the material, and it ionizes the material, which means that it kicks electrons out of the material. Now, the problem is that robots work on electrons. Your computer works on electrons. All of these chips, all of the, all the electronic chips that, that, that you, people use are all, uh, are all work on electrons. I and mean, you can't have a system where the electrons are just randomly being kicked out all over the place because, you know, ultimately the, the whole thing gets scrambled. And that's what they found in, in, in um, Chernobyl. And they, had a, they, had a, they, had, they tried everything. They tried the uh, German, Germans had some very fancy robots, and then they tried uh, robots from somewhere else, and they built their own robots. And none of the robots worked. They worked up to the point where they got into the high radiation fields, and they just went mad, went around in circles, and sort of fell off the side. That's why, in the end, in Chernobyl, they had to send men in. They called them bio robots, and they just they just called up 20,000 men from the reserve army list. And they, they, they put roofing lead around them and, and sent them in to pick up this stuff by their bare hands and throw it, throw it over the side. And, of course, they all died. Uh, you won't hear that. I mean, the international nuclear industry says that, says that nobody really died after Chernobyl except a few of the firemen right at the beginning. But there, there's an enormous number of, of uh, people who died because the Russians sent in these, these young men. And the young men just got huge radiation effects, and then they died, or mostly died before they were 40. Terrifying. But this can't happen in Japan, and the robots won't work. So as I say, there's nothing you can do. They just have to dig around it, isolate it, put up a big notice saying, mankind's folly, and, and keep it cool for, you know, for another thousand years or however long it is. The people that I know, the people that I know from um, Facebook and YouTube and the alternative media who are deeply immersed in the situation and understand its implications are very frustrated and very angry at our respective governments and agencies and the mainstream media for ignoring this. If you had a thousand people at your disposal that have internet but no funding, how would you direct them to make a difference? I know exactly what to do. Uh, as it happens. I mean, this is, a, this is a problem we've had for some time, and I've thought about it for some time, and i figured out what to do. There is something we can do. And in fact, I'm doing it in Europe at the moment. I, I, I launched this in Geneva. I figured it out last year. I went to a conference in Austria, which was uh, called by some people who, who were asking this exact question. And it was a conference of legal people, you know, lawyers from, uh, from various universities and very eminent people. And there was a woman there from the College of William and Mary in Virginia who had studied how you could use the law, human rights law in particular, to protect the environment. And it was not very difficult to convert her book on this uh, and, and the papers that she gave me into a, a strategy. Uh, and this strategy is uh, I launched maybe about two weeks ago from Latvia, um, and, and it, it can function in the European Union. It's not, it, 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 the first stage of it can't function in the United States because there is a, a foot in the door in the, in the European Union, which is the Eurasian Convention. That, that there was a big, um, there was a, a big treaty called the Eurasian Treaty, which was about uh, co collaboration and cooperation between European countries, uh, which was signed in the 60s. Uh, and as a result of this, there is a, there's a, a document called the Basic Safety Standards Directive. Anyway, to cut it short, it's possible to, to um, petition the European Parliament to ask for a re-justification of the Basic Safety Standards Directive. Uh, and this is what we're doing. So any of the people who are listening to this in Europe, uh, if they don't know about it, they should check out, check out the website called www.nuclearjustice.org. And this nuclearjustice.org consists of a number of scientists and jurists and experts and so on, including me. Um, and we are going to use international human rights legislation to stop them. Now, you can also do this in the United States, but, we, but, but, but the main thing is to start it in Europe because it's a lot easier in Europe. In the United States, what we would do is we would get these people to write a petition asking the, um, 
the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the USA, and in Japan it would be some, whatever the equivalent is there, or in Korea or China or wherever it is, and, and, and draw to their attention the fact that nuclear pollution contravenes all of the uh, agreements, all of the international agreements on human rights. Because one of the clauses of the human rights um, legal documentation, which has been signed up to almost every country, is that people have the right to live in an environment which is safe for their health. And so what you can do is you can ask them to justify the, the contamination of the environment under, the, under human rights legislation. And of course in, 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 uh, in Europe or in many countries if they, if they say no, we're not going to do that, then you can take it to the International Court of Justice. So, that, so that's one way that you can, and that's what I would suggest. I don't, I don't see any point in throwing yourself in front, of, in front of diggers and all that. I've done all that, chaining yourself to nuclear power stations and so forth. I mean, it doesn't work. And it just, I mean, it might be fun, but it doesn't work. You've got to take these, on, these people on legally. What kind of response have you had since you started asking people to sign the petition? Yeah, everybody wants to do it, and they will do it. It's all going to happen. In, it's happening in August because that's when the European Parliament is on holiday. Uh, so all these petitions will pile up, and they come back in September, and then we'll have to deal with these petitions. So then we'll have to see what happens. But I think they will be quite hard. It will, it will be quite hard for them to ignore them because they're going to be an awful lot of petitions from an awful lot of important people. And in fact, there's no reason at all why people from the United States can't also. Uh, write a petition to the European Parliament. I mean, they, they, it, it will just add to the general mass of petitions, and they can say, oh, well, this isn't a, a, a valid petition because the person's in the United States. But, but one of the, one of the uh, clauses of the, uh, of the European um, petitions law is that anybody who is resident in a country, that, that is to say they're just living there. You don't have to be a member of the country. You don't have to be Russian. No, sorry. You don't have to be French. You just have to be someone who's living in France. So any people who are living in France or have lived in France or are going to live in France or whatever, you know, who just pretend they're living in France and just put an address there, or Sweden, or any of the countries of the, Euro of the European Union, can write to the Petitions Committee of the European Parliament, and, and uh, the address is given on the website, it's in Brussels, and say, look here, you know, they can download the petition. We've got a, we've got a petition there which is a template, and we put all of the evidence in that their risk model is a load of nonsense. And you just sign it, put your name on it, and send it to them. And I mean, you know, and if it happens to be from Vancouver, well, who cares? You know, it's one more piece of paper they have to look at. Dr. Buzz, we have two more questions from the conspiracy realm, and then we want to open the floor to you at the end for anything that you think might be important to add. Right, go on. Have you seen anything compelling? that would suggest that Fukushima was done on purpose or perpetuated by the Stuxnet virus? No. I haven't. I mean, that's not to say it wasn't. And I think if we're talking conspiracy, probably Chernobyl is much more likely to be a, a target for conspiracy. If you look into that, there are all sorts of very strange things that happen there, which which might, and also there's, there would be quite a good reason for it too, because it, it eventually, it effectively, it destabilized the, the the Soviet Union and led to the fall of the Soviet Union. So you can imagine lots of people who might want that to happen, but I can't really see any point in it. This is this is my 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 concern about all this conspiracy stuff. I mean, I've had people telling me it was harp that you know that that produced the tsunami and, and all sorts of other virus stuff and all this stuff you're talking about. But I, 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 I like to think, well, what's the point of it all, you know? Why, why would anyone bother? So, uh, so, so, so from that point of view, I can't see any point of it. Uh, and, and from the other point of view, I haven't seen any evidence, no. Well, that it seems to me to be just a, a consequence of old reactors, bad design, and, and, and insufficient attention to detail uh, and to you know security from the point of view of, of being inundated by a, a tsunami or shaken shaken by an earthquake, um, and that, and that's good enough really. I can't see it. I can't see you would need to consider anything else. In fact, that's terrifying. That's even more terrifying really. I mean, if somebody got in there and blown it up, well, you think well at least somebody's got in there and blown it up. But the fact that it can just happen just because nobody is able to fix it properly or build it properly in the first place or worry about it properly and, uh, uh, you know, is, is infinitely ter more terrifying because there are a lot of other reactors where the same thing could happen all over the place. 